So we're starting our examination of the normal heart by looking here at the morphologically right atrium. Now as we look at the atrium externally, we can see that posteriorly we have the great veins entering the atrial chamber and entering the right atrium. We have the superior cable vein, we have the inferior cable vein. Anterior to the venous component, we have this broad triangular appendage. And when I open the chamber, I can show you that we can distinguish the appendage from the venous component, because as we see, the venous component has smooth walls, whereas the appendage has pectinated walls. If I then turn back the inferior part of the anterior wall of the atrium, you see that that too is pectinated. And that shows us that the appendage is much more extensive than this broad, blunt, triangular, superior aspect. In fact, as you see, the entirety of the anterior wall of the right atrium is made up by the appendage. As we put the walls back together, we can also see this important groove that interposes between the systemic venous part of the, of the atrium and the appendage. This is the terminal groove or the sulcus terminalis. And on the inside, that marks the location of the terminal crest, which we have cut across in this particular specimen. But as I open the atrium, you can see that the feature of the morphologically right atrium is that the pectinate muscles within the appendage extend all the way around the right atrioventricular junction, reaching the point here where the third of the systemic venous tributaries, the coronary sinus, enters inferiorly into the right atrium. This is the point where the septum comes up meets the atrioventricular junction, and we call this the crux of the heart. When we look internally at the atrium, we can also see another component, and that is this smooth area of musculature between the pectinate muscles and the hinge line of the tricuspid valve. This is the atrial vestibule, and as you see, the vestibule extends all the way around the orifice of the tricuspid valve. If we then look at the posterior wall of the right atrium, we see yet another component, and that is the septum. Now, the septum is not nearly as extensive as is generally thought. The septum, in reality, is focused here upon the oval fossa. The oval fossa is beneath the opening, the superior cable vein, the inferior cable vein, and the coronary sinus. And it is only the floor of this fossa, as I will show you in another specimen, that is a true septal structure, along with this antero-inferior rim. These remaining rims of the oval fossa are no more than infoldings between the attachments of the systemic veins to the morphologically right atrium and the pulmonary veins to the morphologically left atrium. But I'm going to have to dissect into this posterior interatrial groove so as to show you the extent of these infoldings marking the boundaries of the oval fossa.